We're in the book of Revelation, if you didn't know that. So if you uh, will take your Bible and find Revelation chapter 1. Uh, I think we've read five verses, if, I, if I've marked it right here in, in uh, my copy. Let me just remind you of some key words so far. These are just kind of a summary of the key words that you need to know of, of what we've gotten through so far. The first key words in verse 1 is the word revelation. The word is apocalypsis or apocalypsis. Uh, our English word apocalypse and, and, and our culture has, has uh, hijacked that word. They've made it be doom and despair and, and uh, uh, destruction and all those things. That's not what apocalypse means. Apocalypse means unveiling, to be revealed. And so this is the unveiling, the revealing. But now look at what verse 1 says. It is the revelation of Jesus Christ. It's not the revelation of a calendar. It's not the revelation of some events so that we can all make little charts and, and, and have little classes about this is going to happen and this is going to happen. Now, we, we do that, and, and he does give us information, but the revelation is about Jesus Christ. And if you don't see Jesus Christ in this book, you need to read it again because you have missed the point. The point of the, the big picture of this, I talked last week about getting too close to a sign and all you can see are the little dots, the little LEDs. You need to back up and see the big picture. And unless you're seeing Jesus, you've missed the point because this is the revelation, the unveiling of Jesus Christ. The next word that's key is toward the end of verse one and it's the word signified, signified. The word sign is the first syllable of signified. Because he's writing this in a code. Uh, now why? Well, because Christians were under severe persecution. The Romans had set out to destroy this movement called Christianity. And he could not say some things to them directly because the Romans, the authorities would get hold of that and it would lead to further uh, uh, persecution and it could be directed specifically to groups of people. So he was trying to protect them. So he did it in a code. I, uh, Joy and I watched a program last night on History Channel. You may have seen this. It was, uh, it was about 9-11. And it was, it was a story about uh, some of the things that happened behind the scenes that morning uh, when we were under attack that we didn't know were going on. And uh, what, what happened was after the first plane flew into the Twin Tower, the first assumption was it was just uh, a pilot had a heart attack or, you know, some terrible accident happened. And, and uh, nobody really realized what was going on until the second plane hit and then the plane crashed into the Pentagon and then the plane was headed for the White House that ended up crashing in Pennsylvania. And it was really over an hour before all of the heads realized that we were truly under attack. Now, they had a system in place. This is what was fascinating. This is the point I'm getting to. They had a system in place that the military, Department of Defense, the, the uh, executive branch, all of the different departments that would be involved in this kind of thing, uh, that they had practiced and rehearsed what we would do if we ever came under attack like that. And so when they realized we were indeed under attack, well into it now, almost an hour into it, they, 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 they put all that in practice and, and they, they went into that mode. But then they learned something. In all of their thoughts about protecting us from terrorist attacks from the outside, they had never thought that it might happen that way. And so the military had all of these radars that were looking for attacks and planes and missiles that were coming from foreign lands. And so all of NORAD's um, radars were aimed outward from the United States. But now the, the method of attack were domestic commercial airlines, and they weren't coming from outside. They were within the United States. And NORAD and the military did not have the radars that covered the domestic. So they needed the FAA. But the FAA had never been brought into this circle in their rehearsals and practices because nobody had ever thought that this would be the way that it happened. And so it literally took, they, they actually played some of the broadcast, the radio transmissions that were taking place between Secretary of Defense and the Vice President and, 
and, and uh, NORAD, all these different people, and they keep saying, is the FAA on the line? Is the FAA on the line? Is the FAA on the line? And this went on for a long time, and finally the FAA is on the line, so they start asking them questions. And, and if it had not been so serious, it would have been comical. Because the person from the FAA said, I don't know what you're talking about. I don't know what you're asking. And they were using codes and, and numbers and, 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 and words that the person understood the words. I mean, they were in English. They, they knew what the word was that the person was saying. They just didn't know what it meant. Because those numbers and those codes that NORAD and the military and the Pentagon and, and the White House, all of those codes that they had worked out, the FAA was not a part of that. So when they're having these discussions and using these codes, they might as well be speaking Greek. And the guy finally said, I don't know what you are asking me. Well, that's kind of, as I was listening to that last night, I was thinking that's kind of why John wrote this the way he did. Because the Romans will understand the words. They understood Greek. But they won't know what he's talking about. So it is a sign language. It's, it, it's, it's a hidden kind of coded language. Not hidden because God doesn't want us to know it, but hidden because he was protecting. See, this is the revelation of Jesus Christ. God wants this revealed. It's not like God's trying to hide this from us. Now, that's where Christians get real confused sometimes because we think this is some kind of mumbo-jumbo hidden thing. You've got to crack the code and buy this guy's book because he's cracked the code and he's figured out something that God really didn't want us to know. God wants us to know this. It's the revelation of Jesus Christ. It was in the code so that the Romans and those who would have caused problems for the believers so that they would not know. So signified is a key word. The next key word is verse 3, blessed. Blessed. The one who reads this is blessed. Those who hear the words of this prophecy and keep what is written are blessed because the time is near. It is the only book of the Bible about which there is a word of blessing for reading it, hearing it, and obeying it. And at the same time, over at the end of the book, there is a word of cursing if you change it. Revelation 22 verse 19 says, If anyone takes away from the words of this prophetic book, God will take away his share of the tree of life and the holy city written in this book. So I'm not leaving out one single word when I read it. So those are the key words that we have covered so far. Oh, one more key word in verse 4 is the word seven. And that's a key word because that's the first of the signs. That's the first code word. Now, it's a dual code word. It's literal in that there, this is a letter to seven literal churches. And when you get to chapter 2 and 3, we looked at them last week. We'll study them over the next uh, several weeks, months. Uh, there are seven literal churches in Asia Minor that he mentions and that he's writing to. But the word seven is the word for total. It's the word for complete. So it's not only seven to those specific churches, but it's seven to the total church of God, to every church that was in Asia Minor, to every church that has ever existed, to every church that will exist before Jesus comes again, to all of the, of, of the redeemed, to all of the church of God. This letter is written to us. That's the sign of the seven. And there are going to be a lot of those numbers and, and, and pictures that we see as we go through this book. All right, so here's what I want to do. Now we're to new territory. That was all just kind of a reminder of where we've already been. Sometimes when you study books of the Bible like this, and I read a phrase and I stop and talk about that phrase, and then I read the next phrase and I stop and talk about that phrase and read the next phrase and stop and talk about it, we read it all, but you don't hear the beauty of it. You don't hear it kind of in the completeness of the statement that's being made. So, to keep that from happening, and I'm going to try to remind myself to do this as we go through the whole book, because I want to read it all, I want you to hear it all, and I want us to obey it all, because I want us to be blessed. So what I'm going to do tonight, I'm going to read the first eight verses. I don't think we'll get past verse eight tonight. I know we won't, because I haven't studied past verse eight tonight, so that's where we're going to stop when we get to that verse. But... Uh, 
Yeah, that's a hard thing on Wednesday night, you know. Sunday morning, I plan sermons, and I kind of know what I know where I'm, what I'm going to do. Wednesday night, I never really know when I'm, we're going to run out of time. And sometimes, I just get to waxing so eloquent, you know. I get to talking off about something that I didn't even plan to talk about. And before I know it, the time's gone. You know, I'm, you know, I'm teasing about that. But uh, on Wednesday night, I just kind of cut it off when, when I look at the clock and it's time to quit. And uh, so I never really know how far to kind of go in my own thoughts and, and uh, studying, but uh, I, I don't think we'll go past verse eight tonight. But let, let's read the whole first eight verses and uh, hear it in its beauty, and then we'll pick up where we left off. The revelation of Jesus Christ that God gave him to show his slaves what must quickly take place. He sent it and signified it through his angel to his slave, John, who testified to God's word and to the testimony about Jesus Christ in all he saw. The one who reads this is blessed. And those who hear the words of this prophecy and keep what is written in it are blessed because the time is near. John, to the seven churches in Asia, grace and peace to you from the one who is, who was, and who is coming. From the seven spirits before his throne and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead and the ruler of the kings of the earth. To him who loves us and has set us free from our sins by his blood and made us a kingdom, priest to his God and Father, the glory and dominion are his forever and ever. Amen. Look. He is coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him, including those who pierced him. All the families of the earth will mourn over him. This is certain. Amen. I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, the one who is, who was, and who is coming, the Almighty. Now, what we've come to, beginning in about verse Five, really down through verse eight, is a spontaneous doxology. You know, the doxology, uh, we all know the word doxology. There's a song that we sing. Uh, well, we don't sing it much, but there's a song we used to sing called the doxology. You know the song? Let's sing the song. You know the song? Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise him, all creatures here below. Praise him above ye heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. And if you were in a formal church, you sang. That's right. That word, doxology, just means praise. Praise praise. And what you have here in verse 5, 6, and 7 is that as John starts writing down what he has seen, God has given him this vision. And as he starts writing down the words that God has given him, he just breaks out into a spontaneous doxology. He just cannot contain himself and he starts almost singing this praise to God. Now it is not uh, unique just to uh, John. Other writers uh, do that as well. For example, over in Ephesians chapter 3, Paul, at the end of the third chapter, Paul said, Now to him who is able to do above and beyond all that we ask or think according to the power that works in us, to him be glory in the church in Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen. That's a doxology. When you go over to 1 Timothy chapter 1, it's a, it's a doxology. Just, it, it just breaks out into spontaneous praise to God for what he's done. Uh, it, it, it says, uh, Now to the King, eternal, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. When you read what Jude wrote, uh, Jude, the end of the book of Jude, now to him who is able to protect you from stumbling and to make you stand in the presence of his glory, blameless with great joy, to the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ our Lord, be glory and majesty and power and authority before all time, now and forever. Amen. You hear it? They just break out in doxology. They just start thinking about what they're writing and it just overcomes them and they just can't help themselves. And they just... I don't know if they actually sang it or not, but they just start 
praising God for who he is and what he's done. Well, that's what John does in these words. It, it, it's, a, it's a doxology. Now, we've already studied verse 4 and uh, part of verse 5 that uh, the seven spirits, I told you that's probably a reference back to uh, the book of, of um, um, Zechariah, excuse me, Isaiah chapter 11. There's a, there's a passage over there that that's probably a reference back to. Uh, we, we dealt with the first part of verse 5 last week. But look in the middle of verse 5. Now, in, in my copy of Scripture, this is the beginning of a new paragraph. Is it for you? Uh, verse 5 kind of breaks right there in the middle. You're in the same verse, but it starts a new paragraph. It says, to him who loves us. Now, the word to there, he's already said to one time, back up in verse 4. He said to the seven churches in Asia. But that time, it was the salutation of a letter. That's who he's writing the letter to, these seven churches in Asia. Ultimately, every church, every believer. But now the word to is almost like the dedication of a book. You know, when you buy a book, remember books, those hard copy things, not the, not the things we read on our iPads and, and computers, but a real book, when you open it, one of the first pages would have a dedication page. I dedicate this to my beautiful wife. I dedicate this to my children, whoever it might be. It's almost like this is the dedication, and he's dedicating this to the Lord who has done so much for us. And he starts by saying, to him who loves us. Now, does anybody's translation say something other than loves with an S who loves us? Does anybody's translate? I see some hands. It says loved with a D. Loved with a D. There's a little difference between saying him who loved with a D and saying him who loves with an S, right? So why are there different? I mean, it's all God's word. Why are there different translations sitting here right now? You're holding in your hands. And one says loved, past tense. And one says loves, present tense. But here's the, here's the reason. In the Greek language, this is just a little grammar. I won't delve into this too much because we all get lost in this stuff. But in the Greek language, when you talk about tense, tense is different than in English. In English, tense deals with past, present, and future. And so when some commentary uh, or when Bible translators see that the tense that it's in, they, like in English, they make it past, present, and future. So someone said he loved us. But actually, it is an aorist tense verb. An aorist tense doesn't have to do with past, present, or future. It has to do with action. And what that word means is that it is a continuous action. So you can say he loved us. That is correct. What yours says is correct. He loved us in the past. You can say he loves us right now. That is correct. You could also say he will love us. Because it is a continuous action verb that means God always loved us. Do you know that there are people that don't believe that? You would think that is one of the most basic elementary things that every Christian could agree on that God loves people. Did you know that people don't agree on that? My sweet wife reads every word of the paper. I don't read every word. I read the first part of a story and the end of a story and all that stuff in the middle is just filler. The first and the last tells you everything you need to know in those stories. So I just read the first and the last. She reads it all. She cut out a, something out of the Hendersonville Standard a few weeks ago and uh, put it on the counter for me to see. And somebody had paid. Now, they paid for this. Somebody paid to put a little statement in the Hendersonville Standard in the classified that said, God does not love everybody. If you have not repented, he does not love you. Really? Really? Well, I read in the Bible, for God so loved the whole world that he gave his own son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. I read in the Bible that before we loved him, he loved us. I read in the Bible that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. The godly for the ungodly. It is a basic teaching of our faith. God loves you. Now, he doesn't like everything we do. He doesn't love everything that's going on in this world. He doesn't love all of the activities, all of the movements. He doesn't love all of the things that people are involved in. But God loves people. 
And he sent his son to die on the cross so that any person who would repent, that person could have everlasting life. Now, the next little phrase there is interesting too. It says, he loves, loved, will love, however you want to say that. It's linear. To him who loves us and has set us free. Now, does anybody's Bible say anything other than he set us free? I see a hand. 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 There are a lot of you. It doesn't say he set us free. It says he washed us, right? He washed us. Well, now, why does some of your Bibles say that he washed us and some say he set us free? Well, both of those things are correct. The word that some of those translators translated that he washed us, the word in, in the Greek language, when I say the word in Greek, it sounds like an English word. The word is lusante. Lusante. What does that sound like? Loosed. Loose, so that you, you can see how he set us free, right? You can see how he set us free comes out of lusante. If lusante means loose, then you can see that. But, but it also at times is translated, he washed us. And so you'll see different copies of scripture. One says this, one says that. They're both accurate. They're both right. He loves us and he set us free or he washed us and I don't care which one of those you want to go with because they're both absolutely true and if you grab hold of that and get that in your heart you'll leave here with one foot saying amen and the other foot saying hallelujah and your hands will get in on it too because both of those things are good news he he, he washed us some of you who have young children at home they go out and play and get all kinds of dirty and come home do you not love them until you get them washed and cleaned up now you love them while they're dirty don't you you want them to get clean. I remember one time I was coaching. I shouldn't tell you some of this stuff. I'm, the statute of limitations might not have run out on some of this. I was coaching uh, my kids in football, and we'd had practice, and, and uh, it was muddy. It had rained, and um, we finished football practice, and the kids, I had three or four of them from our neighborhood that I was supposed to bring back home after practice. and I mean, they were covered with, they were covered with mud. Now, one of the things you may or may not know about me is that I'm a little, um, um, I, I, I like things to be where they're supposed to be. I like things to be neat. And, and uh, now you might not walk into my study and think that that's true, but uh, I know where it all, I know where it is and I want it where it is right at this moment because that's where I put it. Uh, I, I'm to the point where one time I was taking one of my kids to another football practice and he dropped a gum wrapper on the floor of my truck and it was driving me crazy. There was a gum wrapper on the floor of my truck and I reached over to pick up the gum wrapper because it literally was driving me crazy and when I did I pulled the steering wheel to the right and we were going about 40 miles an hour and I hit a curb and that gum wrapper cost me two tires and two wheels. That was about a $600 gum wrapper because those things bother me. Well, I had to take them home. They were covered with mud. I had a choice to make. I didn't have a truck at that point. I was driving a car, so I did what I thought was the only intelligent thing to do. I popped open the trunk and said, get in. <laughs> and I took them home. Now, they were filthy, but their mamas loved them. They didn't love me so much, but they loved them even when they were covered with all of that mud. They didn't have to get clean before their mamas loved them. They loved them. God loved us before we were clean. You see that? He loved us first. And there's an order to that. You see, that's, what I'm, that's the point I'm making. He loved us first, and then he washed us. Have you been to Jesus for his cleansing power? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you fully trusting in his grace this hour? Oh, be washed in the blood of the lamb. I mean, that's, an, that's a great statement. But if your copy, like mine says, that he set us free, that's pretty good too. Because that's the picture of chains. We've been bound by chains and he has removed those chains and he has set us free. Um, blessed be the name of the Lord. He has set us free from the chains that bind us. Uh, that is amazing grace, isn't it? So it's all wrapped up in those words. To him who loves us and has set us free. By the way, whether you translate it, he set us free, or you translate it, he has washed us, that is not an aorist 
tense word. Where he loved us is linear. He loved us in the past. He loves us right now. He's going to love us in the future. That word is at a moment in time. It is an action that he did. And he did it once and for all. He set us free. He washed us. And that, that one act. Now, you know, sometimes I'll talk to people. Somebody said this to me recently. How long have you been a Christian? And their answer was, I've always been a Christian. Well, now I know what most people mean when they say that. I was raised in a Christian home. I've always known about Jesus. I've always been taught that God loves me. I've always believed that the Bible was true. I've always gone to church. That's what they mean. But there was a moment in time when you came to understand you are a sinner. There was a moment when you went from lost to saved. When you put your faith in Christ. So that's that's that word that he has set us free. Well, how did he do that? By his blood. By his blood. Every now and then you'll hear somebody say, sometimes it's folks from a a little bit more formal denominations, and they'll say, I don't know why you evangelical Christians talk about the blood so much. It's so gory. Why do you focus on the blood? Well, it's because without the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness for our sins. And it is through that sacrifice that Jesus made that we have been made righteous you can't you can't take the blood out of the Bible and have anything it's it's the blood of Jesus that that has redeemed us so to him who loves us and has set us free from our sins by his blood and has made us a kingdom now what does that mean well he's talking about citizenship citizenship John was not a a, a Roman citizen. Citizenship in those days, citizenship, Roman citizenship was for the aristocracy. It was for a special group of people. Remember when Paul was uh, being tried and he was sent from one place to another place to another place and he finally said, I am a citizen and that changed everything. They couldn't treat him the same way. They couldn't handle this the same way because he was a a citizen. Citizenship came with great Uh, privilege he says we are now citizens of a new kingdom I'm glad to be an American I'm thankful to be an American I believe with all of our problems it's the greatest place on earth we have so much freedom thank God for for those that paid the price for us to have what we enjoy but we have a citizenship that is in heaven waiting for us We have a new kingdom. He says he's made us a kingdom. Priest to to our God. Priest. Did you know you're a priest? I was on a, had a group from our church several years ago over in, in, I don't remember where we were, but the guy that was with us was, I guess we were in England and he was Anglican. And uh, when he figured out I was the pastor, of the church and all these people that were with us were members of our church. He, he, he couldn't accept that I was a pastor and I was dressed like I was dressed. It just freaked him out because he'd never seen a priest dressed like I was dressed. So just to let the guy not have, you know, uh, nightmares when he went to bed at night, I buttoned my top collar and took a business card and stuck it in the top of my collar. <laughs> And he was okay. (laughs) Now I'm the priest. Listen, you are a priest. That means, think about what all a priest does. You can come into the presence of God. You can do your own praying. You have communion with the Father. I'm telling you, one of the greatest doctrines that we have as Baptists is the priesthood of the believer. Now, I count it an honor to pray for you, and if you ask me to pray for you, I do. I do. And I know you pray for me. But when you ask me to pray for you, it is not because I am your only way to God. You are a priest before God, and we have a high priest, and his name is Jesus. And we come into the presence of the Father as his priest He's made us a kingdom, priest to God and Father. The glory and dominion are his forever and ever. Amen. The word amen, he uses it twice in this passage. The word amen means yes. 
It means I agree. It's the same in Greek. It's the same in Hebrew. I agree. When you say amen, when you hear a song that moves your spirit, when a preacher says something or your connect group leader says something from the word of God and it moves your spirit and you say amen, you're saying I agree. I am in tune with what you are saying. Well, how foolish I was to think we would get through verse 8. But we did get through verse 6. We are moving along at a rapid pace, are we not? I promise you, I keep telling you this, it will go faster. Sooner or later, it will go faster. All right, thank you for coming. It is the hour to go, so let me lead us in a word of prayer. Father, thank you again for the time. Thank you for the fellowship. Thank you for the friendship. Thank you for your word. Your word is truth. We hold to it. We love it. Help us to live it. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Good night.